One of the things that we do here on this broadcast is we talk about religions, high control cults, and I consider Islam to be one of those. There's a documentary that just released to YouTube that talks about Islam, and I wanted to speak to the producer of that documentary, Miriam Namazi. Hi, Miriam. Hi, Seth. Uh, great to be here. Hope you're doing well. Do you get tired of being just a legend, Miriam? <laughs> Look, let me, tell, let me tell everybody a story really quick, okay? This was years and years ago. I think this is the time that we met in person. It may have been at the Imagine No Religion Conference. Now, I'm a mm. communicator. I'm a storyteller. And I'm, you know, I'm able to string a few sentences together. So I go on stage and I give a presentation that I feel really good about. And the audience responds and I'm walking off to my chair feeling pretty satisfied. Miriam Namazi goes up after me and just kicks my ass. I mean, she just standing ovation and just totally engages the crowd in this amazing way. And that's the memory I, I have I of you, Mary. I don't remember that, actually. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's talk about, well, first of all, this may be a revelation to you and our audience, but I am white. Okay. And mm -hmm. for some people, somehow this becomes a disqualifier as if Islam is a race as if white mm -hmm. people don't practice Islam. And you run into this. Is that right, Miriam? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh, I think we're seeing a lot of that because we are living uh, during an era that is very much, um, you know, prone to identity politics. And uh, what identity politics does is it reduces you into a certain identity and then it gives you permission to speak about things and not speak about other things based on what your identity is considered to be or perceived to be. And it completely makes the identity devoid of thoughts, politics, class, social and political movements, things that make us fully human, you know, because the reality is we have so many characteristics that define us uh, and reducing human beings to one specific identity in order to prevent them from speaking or giving them, uh, you know, the, the leeway to only speak about certain things is just so problematic. I mean, clearly, of course, you can be white and... Uh, be racist, you can be white and anti-racist, you can be a woman and be a feminist, you can be a woman and be a sexist, you know, so I think uh, that doesn't tell the whole story. But I think, you know, it it is a sort of, um, this is something we all face, it's not just so-called white people who aren't allowed to talk about Islam. A lot of times we're not allowed to talk about it either, we're told that we weren't real Muslims to begin with. Uh, which I find quite funny because, you know, the, the, they're very quick to add up every single Muslim in the world and say, you know, we have X number of Muslims in the world. But the minute you say, I don't agree anymore, then you weren't really a real one <laughs> to begin with. So there are all these preconditions to stop you from criticizing, to stop you from talking. If I see identity politics in the light of being able to focus on a marginalized group to highlight their specific challenges. Mm. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, we're talking about the ex-Muslim women leaving Islam. So um, we're able to talk about a specific demographic and these specific challenges they face. I mean, would that be fair, Miriam? Yeah, I mean, I do not see that as identity politics, funny, funnily enough. I mean, I think, um, you know, Things have become so mixed up now that it's hard to see the truth of things yeah. uh, in a lot of instances. And I, I you know, I compare the ex-Muslim movement with the civil rights movement in the U.S. or the gay rights movement or, uh, you know, um, the suffragist movements, movements for equality, for rights. Uh, and not um, a form of identity politics, because if you look at identity politics, it's really about either, uh, you know, insisting on difference or on supremacy. And these can be two sides of the same coin in a way. It's part of a very, you know, uh, double-edged sword in a way. I'm Whereas, interested. Oh, forgive me. I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry, Miriam, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no. So whereas, you know, the, the focus on ex-Muslims, for example, is about the human right to apostasy, to freedom of conscience, uh, to being non-believers in a world that privile- privileges religion. So it's very different from identity politics that focuses on, let's say, the Muslim community and says you're not allowed to criticize that community or the so-called, uh, you know, white working class. That's another part of this identity politics that we see where it's as if, you know, what the white working class decides on is sacred. And so we have to accept Brexit and and any sort of reaction and regression because the wor- white working class says it so. And again, there is no one white working class. There is no one Muslim community. There is no one ex-Muslim community. Um, but I would distinguish this fight as a fight for equality as opposed to identity politics, if you know what I mean. I am frustrated by the disqualifiers, Miriam. Uh, It's a lose-lose. So I go on and I talk about Christianity, and they say, why won't you criticize Islam, you coward? So I criticize (laughs) Islam, and they say, but what about Christianity? Or why would somebody from the West be able to criticize what's happening on another continent? Or why would an ex-Christian speak about Islam? Or you're a man. How can you advocate or relate to the plights, human rights plights of women? I mean, they put this gauntlet together that I'm supposed to jump through. When I thought, Jesus Christ, I thought advocacy for each other as human beings was the point. And I think there is uh, there are a lot of branches on this tree, but Islam uses this in many ways to prevent you from criticizing. You're simply disqualified across the board, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think... It is a really uh, difficult situation because, uh, you know, you do understand that people don't want to be criticizing a minority group. There's this huge anti-racist movement, which rightfully makes people careful about not wanting to feed into racism. Uh, So you can understand why people do it. You know, a lot of it comes from a good place. Uh, But what actually happens is that those who are in power, those who are perpetuating uh, the inequalities, for example, the uh, the fundamentalists of all religions, but here we're talking about Islamic fundamentalists, they use that as a way of silencing dissent, you know, and as you said, we are all fundamentally human beings, and we have a responsibility towards each other. And, you know, I, I am now 54 years old, so I do remember a time when you could actually show solidarity with black South Africans against racial apartheid, even if you were white, even if you were not South African. You could defend uh, the gay rights movement, even if you were straight. You know, it was seen to be the responsibility of every decent human being to demand equality for gay people, to demand equality for black people, irrespective of what your personal characteristics were, because it's about... The, the common cause and the common goals in which we as human beings work towards in order to have a fairer, better world and society. And and so it's, it's really interesting how fundamentalists and tyrants have managed to hide behind and use identity politics as a way of silencing anyone who wants to dissent. And lots of good people are, are, are sort of aligning with them and saying, yes, you're not allowed to speak about X and Y. And I think we should be able to speak about anything, you know, and everything. And that's part of being fully human, really, is having that empathy and being able to show that solidarity. Miriam Namazi, correct me if I've gotten this wrong, but I've said in the past that I think the term Islamophobia is a bullshit term, like Mm -hmm. being afraid of the idea Uh, Because Islam being an idea, that's not the same as anti-Muslim bigotry. So I look at Islamophobia as a kind of conversation stopper. It's kind of a nothing term. Am I wrong about that? No, I I think definitely you're right. Because if we look at the phobias uh, that relate to people in the world, for example, homophobia or xenophobia, these are phobias and hatred of gay people, of migrants, 
uh, and the, the so-called foreigner, you know. So in that sense, you can understand why it's linked to bigotry. But Islam is a, an idea, and like all ideas, it has to be uh, and uh, open to criticism. And so the term Islamophobia really is um, a, an attempt by fundamentalists to stop criticism of Islam. And they do it, you know, very well by equating criticism of Islam with an attack on believers and the so-called Muslim community. And so it's it has become one and the same as bigotry in mainstream society, which is hugely dangerous. And if we look at World Hijab Day that took place on the 1st of February, one of the hashtags that they were promoting was end hijab phobia. And again, hijab is a piece of... Uh, clothing, uh, but it's very clearly a symbol also of the fundamentalist control on women's lives, their bodies, their sexualities. So again, hijab phobia, equating that with an attack on, on women who wear the hijab is part of that, you know, that fundamentalist narrative to prevent any criticism. And of course, as you say, you know, Islam is an idea, the hijab is a symbol of women's um, oppression. So we should be able to criticize it while at the same time being very clear that um, we're opposed to any form of bigotry, prejudice, uh, hate against people, because those are very different things. This kind of thoughtfulness does not play well on Twitter, Miriam. I mean, in 280 Mm -hmm. characters to talk about the difference between advocating for Muslims, many of them oppressed. I mean, the people most oppressed by fundamentalist Islam are Muslims, and we are human rights advocates. We want to protect life and liberate those people. It's, you know, it's hard to have that discussion. And, uh, you know, you talk about the hijab. I run into this, and I want to get into terms in just a second. But, you know, to talk about how we should not celebrate this tool of oppression and dehumanization, Mm -hmm because it is being used to dehumanize people, it's not the same as telling women what they can and cannot wear. And yet that's what I hear. How dare you tell a woman what she can't? And you're just trying to control women in another way. And I'm like, no, no, I'm just saying we don't celebrate the hijab until it really is an option for everyone. How do you frame this complicated discussion, Mm -hmm. Miriam Namazi? Yeah, it is. It is a difficult one because the reality is that we're not having these discussions in a vacuum. We are also having these discussions uh, at a time when we have both the rise of the far right, the populist, uh, you know, uh, right, white nationalists, white supremacists, uh, as well as the rise of the religious fundamentalists. So the, this discussion is taking place within that framework. So it's understandable that people want to defend women who wear the hijab, but the issue is more fundamental than that. And it's, you know, the fact that uh, people should be able to criticize the hijab and refuse to wear it. The reality is that whilst there is, there, there must be women who've chosen to wear the hijab, Uh, For a large number of people on a mass scale, uh, it isn't really a choice and a right. The very fact that it's a religious imposition makes it clearly not a choice because it is something religion requests and imposes on women. I started wearing a headscarf when I was eight years old. Uh, My parents never forced me, but it was expected of me that when I turned nine, I had to wear a headscarf. What many people don't understand about the hijab is that a lot of people view the hijab as just like the head covering and it's bad enough as just the head covering but the hijab has conditions attached to it like it has to be opaque, it has to be loose, it has to uh, not imitate the disbelievers in any fashion so you can't be wearing like a big cross with it. Um, uh, it, uh, It has to be you can't have like all your ornaments showing while you're wearing it. It is meant to be a complete erasure of your individuality, which was why it's strange that I chose it as individuality. Um, But it's meant to take away that from you in the public eye. It's very much linked to this idea that, uh, you know, if a woman is unveiled, you've seen the billboards, I'm sure, Uh, she's like an unwrapped candy that will be swarmed by flies, 
uh, or she's like a rotten potato. The reason the onion is so good and never rots is because it's got all these layers. But the potato, it's got such a thin layer, it rots very quickly. These are actual billboards that you see in countries like Iran and Afghanistan. In Iran, for example, it's compulsory to wear the hijab. So, uh, you know, we have to have the discussion, why do women have to wear it? It's a religious imposition. And also, uh, because women are seen to be the source of chaos, if women are unveiled, uh, men will swarm, it will cause, I mean, one. Uh, I had a debate with the head of the Muslim Association of Britain once, and he said that, you know, if women are not properly veiled, then they will, the adultery will happen, rapes will happen, then they'll have to stone people to death. Isn't it better that they just <laughs> impose veiling rules, uh, you know, uh, as a way of uh, preventing this sort of chaos that will take place? When I was a younger girl and when we were being taught about the hijab, um, it was never presented in a way of, you know, men shouldn't be looking at you. It was always presented in a way where your body is of so much value that men can't look at you. Um, and I think I bought into that, especially as a young person who wanted that kind of empowerment. Um, and it's, it's completely false. It's a complete lie. But there was this one day we were on the beach and like obviously on the beach in Italy, everyone's kind of in bikinis, sometimes topless. And I was there with my little burkini, kind of fully covered, looking really odd. Um, and then my friends were in their bikinis. So I was kind of like trying to act like I was confident in my burkini, like this is what I'm supposed to do. But as I was sitting there, I was looking around and I was thinking like these women that are wearing a lot less than I am, are actually getting less attention, but also, I understood in that moment that, you know, there isn't this kind of like guys going crazy and like, it's not chaos. It's not kind of like, these men aren't like animals where they're gonna like pounce on you and you, and I really started to think about that. And that moment really stayed with me because I realized, hold on, the hijab is to protect us and to kind of, you know, our modesty is supposed to, you know, all the things I used to say is like, we're like a pearl, we're beautiful, we're too beautiful to be seen. And if men see us, I don't really know what the other side is, but it's just this expectation that men can't handle it, I guess. Um, so that, I understood it as, hold on, in the West where people are a lot more naked, the men are a lot more respectful. And if I were to go to Morocco, where my mother's from, or Egypt, where my dad's from, um, you know, these countries that, that I know, or any other Muslim country, really, uh, even later on, I went to Pakistan, you know, even if you just show like a bit of leg, the men go crazy and they stalk you and it's dangerous. It's, it's actually dangerous for a woman to go out on her own and not be hassled by these men. So the concept of hijab as a function in society to protect women and to create this kind of harmonious way of living between men and women actually wasn't working and didn't work. And that was the first thing that I, that, that was my doubt. Cause I was like, how come, how come it's, you know, not having it and having this respect between men and women, regardless of what the hell I'm wearing, you know, there is this respect there. The other issue is that it's, you know, once you wear it, it's near impossible to take it off. It is really difficult to take it off. And so if you don't have the choice to take it off, if you don't have the choice to say, um, you know what, I'm not going to wear it. It's not really a right and a choice. Uh, but apart from all of that, I mean, for me, uh, seeing that World Hijab Day is being celebrated is kind of like if there was a World FGM Day to celebrate FGM or to celebrate breast ironing or to celebrate foot binding, you know, it's celebrating really something that is so fundamentally misogynist and sexist. And it's it's really an affront to women's rights, to feminism, uh, for this day to be celebrated in this way. And I do think it's really part of the whole Islamist, the fundamentalist project to normalize the way women are treated under Islam and to make it okay. And the hijab is really integral to that project. On the World Hijab Day, you had popularized, many people had popularized the alternate hashtag, No Hijab Day. And people were posting images of themselves before and after, 
right, when they were veiled and when they weren't. Can you walk me through a few of the terms and definitions, the hijab versus the niqab, uh, the full covering, the partial covering? Can you educate us? Mm. Well, I mean, uh, the hijab is usually, um, I guess, in different countries also, it's it's worn differently. Uh, but the hijab is usually, um, um, I guess, the, what what's called the headscarf. And then you've got the niqab, which is a face covering. You've got the burqa, which is a full, complete, you know, like a tent. And you've got in Iran, you've got a chador, which is kind of another a f- black fabric generally that covers the woman uh, but shows her face. So it's always uh, different ways of hiding a woman's body and hiding her sexuality and ensuring uh, that she is kept, uh, she's not seen in the public space. And I always compare this with, uh, you know, a racial apartheid in South Africa or the segregation, racial segregation you had in the United States, you know, where uh, black and white people had to be kept separate for the uh, harmony of society. I mean, that's how they used to portray it as something positive, as something that would be beneficial to both black and white people to have the segregation. And we see very much that sort of manipulation and propaganda when it comes to segregation of the sexes. Uh, the veil is but one in a series of things that Uh, is the reality for women under Islamic rules. So in Iran, for example, um, you know, it includes uh, the fact that women and men have to enter government offices via separate entrances. Uh, There's a curtain in the sea for uh, men and women, for example. It it is uh, actual segregation. It is a form of uh, what, what, what we call gender apartheid or sex apartheid. And so the veil is... It is a symbol of all of these things that take place um, against women and their status. And it begins really early on from school age, for example, before puberty, girls are meant to veil and it means they can't run. Their voices can't be heard very loudly. They shouldn't be riding bicycles. They shouldn't be playing with boys. Uh, They have um, different books for girls and boys very often. Uh, when you get to university, some fields of study are closed to girls completely, to women. In Iran, for example, you can't be a judge because, you know, women are too emotional. It it goes, it, it follows you throughout your life. So sometimes people will say, but it's just a piece of cloth. Just get over it. But it's not just a piece of cloth. It represents a, a, a sort of apartheid that follows a woman throughout her life. It certainly wasn't just a piece of cloth for those that you interviewed. Uh, or had interviewed for the documentary Women Leaving Islam. Before I talk about the documentary, this is not the same as the the TED Talk you had given. It was this a couple of years ago. Did they refuse to release it? I, I was following the story, but I, I didn't get all of it. What exactly happened with TED? Yes, yeah, so I was invited in January of last year uh, for a TEDx Warwick talk. Uh, it was on uh, the topic was creativity in crisis. TEDx Warwick is a uh, the largest student run uh, TEDx in Europe, and uh, it was uh, about creativity in crisis. And I spoke about creativity in challenging Islamic fundamentalism. And the Islamic Society at Warwick had complained, uh, and they wanted things to be censored. But anyway. After several meetings with them and my refusing to remove any of my slides, um, my talk went ahead. Um, And so I've been following up with them because of COVID and because of the delays. They haven't, uh, uh, you know, published many of the speeches, but they've started to publish some of them. And I did follow up with them to ask what had happened. And they basically said that... um, my talk violates TED Global's guidelines. And so that's why they're not going to be broadcasting it. And I did ask for further clarification. They've asked TED Global for further clarification, um, but I haven't heard anything yet. So your instinct, though, not to interrupt, but uh, your instinct is that they just don't want to be called an Islamophobe or anti-religion, or they just don't want to take the heat? I mean, I know you're speculating, but... uh... 
You know, well, they have said it's violating guidelines. So that obviously, I mean, my talk is about Islam, is about uh, creativity, including everything from dancing uh, um, during Ramadan, which is not allowed, to drinking wine uh, instead of fasting, to uh, topless and nude protests. So, you know, to carrying allies, gay signs, drawing gay pride. These are all the things that we've done in a, as a challenge to Islamic fundamentalism. I mean, it brings fear and death and despair. And we use creativity and humor um, as a way of challenging them and opening up the space for people to be less afraid and to feel that they're able to react and, and stand up to this movement. And so, you know, that was what my talk was about. So clearly not very um, easy topics, of course. And, you know, I, I don't know why. I was surprised when they invited me. They should have known better, you know, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm not surprised. I mean, I did a recent interview with Byline TV. They're supposed to be the ones that publish all the news that no one else will do. But again, they haven't published mine because they said there's a lot of sensitivity around the issue. Um, I did an in-depth interview with Iran International and Iranian TV uh, about religion, about the rise of atheism in Iran and all, all of these various issues. Again, they didn't publish that. They said it was offensive. Uh, so, you know, it's not something I'm not used to. It, I do kind of just try and ignore it and move on. But I, I'm getting a bit, you know, sometimes I do get annoyed and feel like, you know what, I'm going to just say something publicly just because I feel like I need to say something sometimes. Well, uh, you um, have in your biography that Iran's media <laughs> outlets have called you immoral and corrupt. And yes. uh, you've been called anti-God. Hell, you've probably been called every name in the book. In the first <laughs> frames of the documentary Women Leaving Islam, there's a quote from you. It says, the Quran, Islam, and Islamism are the greatest stumbling blocks in the way of women's emancipation. I've said in my own life, uh, to the chagrin of a lot of my listeners, that I think Islam right now is the most dangerous religion in the world. Would you mm. agree, disagree? I, I mean, that quote is actually a play on something that Elizabeth um, Cady Stanton uh, said about Christianity during the fight for the right to vote during the suffragist movement uh, in the United States. And, you know, there she talked about how Christianity and the Bible are the greatest bulwarks uh, to women's emancipation. And I think that today we can clearly say that about Islam. I wouldn't say Islam is the most dangerous religion. I do think all religions are dangerous. I've said before that I think... Um, Religions are like cigarettes. They should come with health warnings. Uh, they kill. Uh, and I do think that it depends, of course, on uh, the amount of power that they have. You know, if you look at the Inquisition, for example, and what Christianity has done across um, uh, uh, history, you, you, you can see that it's not that the Bible's changed or that it's become a nicer religion. It's just lost some of its political power. And where it still has power in some African countries, for example, you can see, um, you know, the, the, the witch huntings and the exorcisms and torture of children in the name of religion that takes place. So I think Islam is the most dangerous now in the sense because it has so much state power. There are 13 countries that punish apostasy and blasphemy with the death penalty. In Iran, there are 130 offenses that are punishable by death, including heresy, including blasphemy, um, including apostasy, uh, witchcraft, you know, and that's something that they often accuse women of, as well as sex outside of marriage. You know, those are things that could find you uh, with the death penalty. In fact, stoning to death. So in that sense, it is the most dangerous. But I think we should be wary in thinking that it's only Islam, because we are living in an era with the rise of the populist right, the far right, as well as uh, religious fundamentalisms of all stripes. So if we look at, uh, for example, the Christian right in the United States, very, very dangerous. And I think, you know, uh, with the Trump presidency that came to the forefront, and uh, it's still not over in the United States, obviously, with uh, with Trump being gone, it, it, it helped us see something that is really very 
very dangerous in the United States. You've got uh, the Buddhist right. You know, you always talk about Buddhists being so cuddly and lovely and wonderful. But they are fascists in Myanmar and in Sri Lanka, where they are hunting down Muslims and um, and killing them. And of course, in India now, you've got the Hindu right government, the Modi government, who are fascists as well. And they are, you know, they, there's mob uh, violence in, in, in India against Muslims, for example, uh, being killed for eating beef, for example. So... This is something that is on the rise and we shouldn't just think that it's Islam um, because I think what uh, Islamic states show us is the potential of it, you know, spreading like wildfire. Uh, because if you look at photos of our countries, of Iran, of Afghanistan, um, of, uh, of Iraq, lots of countries in the Middle East, look at photos of, of uh, 40 years ago. It's, you know another world uh, women were uh, allowed to dress how they wanted they were educated they had access and that was 40 years ago you know so we went backwards because of the rise of the religious right in our countries and the same could happen you know look what's happening in Poland now uh, with um, the the rise of uh, the the Christian right there uh, you know, they've lost the right to abortion. They've lost it. They're, you're losing it in several states in the United States as well. They've lost um, gay rights issues. Things that they fought for and we we take for granted are being lost uh, by uh, the rise of this movement. And it can happen anywhere. And that's a fair point. And I receive your wisdom on that. I mean, you're absolutely mm -hmm. right about, I mean, Iran back in the 1970s, women were going to university and you know, culturally, they were so free, and then you know, at the drop of a hat, the snap of a finger, a theocracy mm. stripped them of so much. I was heartbroken watching the documentary, which, by the way, I've put that YouTube link for women leaving Islam in the description box, and I encourage you to go watch it. But I was heartbroken when I was hearing the stories, the very personal stories of these sort of shrouded, cut-off, dehumanized women, girls, mm -hmm. you know, who became women. And they were absolutely at the mercy of every male figure in their life. I remember the emotions that went through me as I grew older and realizing what was taken from me and why was it taken from me. So men was granted more and more power, but woman is like, she has nothing actually in Islam. Uh, outside of this world, I can say, I don't. No, there is people in our world, they don't believe in God. I don't know there is people in our world, they don't have any religion. And then I was completely shocked. It's, I feel like it's important information, why they hide it, why I don't know it. We have very scary teachers. In retrospect, I'm like, wow, they're really scary people that would teach us at like five years old uh, you're going to have your hair hung you know um, this st every strand that you show you're going to be hung from that uh, if you show your hair to men um, you know you're going to burn uh, just all the horrible descriptions of your skin burning and then coming again and you're going to have to have like lead hot lead poured into your ear and all these weird weird horrible things when you learn that as a child it's so scarring and I think it really stays with you. If we study Quran uh, closely and observe the things, what, what is happening, and also in the society, people treated uh, women such as, uh, yeah, a little creature. I mean, it's not a, maybe it's not a nice word to say, but it is the situation in the Muslim countries. And having these questions and this anger and this emotion and saying, why the hell did they do this to me? The great thing about the film Women Living Islam is that despite all the restrictions, that uh, the women were able to break free and live a life of their choosing. The risks are high and it is very painful. Uh, it is a very, very painful journey and process. And I think... Um, that's what makes the film so moving and inspiring to actually see that. Uh, but that there are many women who remain believers as well who manage to break uh, free from these restrictions. And, and I think if we look at uh, a lot of movements in the Middle East, in North Africa, in South Asia, uh, they are women-led because, uh, you know, uh, uh, because 
uh, women are, despite all the risks, breaking free from the, the constraints. But I think, you know, why it happens is is the age-old question, why do religions um, control women in this way? Why do they target women in this way? And I think because it is a very um, easy way of maintaining control, it's a very visible way of making clear who's in charge. And uh, it is um, a way of making sure that people know their place in society. And it begins with women, of course, but it doesn't end with them. And I think even if you look at um, the Iranian revolution, it was not an Islamic revolution. U.S. foreign policy had a lot to do with the fact that an Islamic state came into being. uh, Because if you remember, it was during the Cold War at the time, when um, the U.S. government was trying to create a green Islamic belt around the Soviet Union, and they supported, for example, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. So it was very much part of U.S. foreign policy to have an Islamic state in Iran. There was a conference in Guadeloupe where they decided on this. These are things now, you know, there's historical amnesia in the world, as we know. Um, Today, it's as if, you know, we were uh, uh, an Islamic state all our lives, whereas that's not the case. And even though it was only 40 years ago, uh, now when we criticize, we're told to respect our culture, you know, and our religion as if uh, it's it's something that has been there uh, in, our, in our DNA and that we cannot question or challenge. So I think, yes, um, it's a good way of controlling. And if you look in Iran, um, they came for women first. And I think you see that in a lot of religious right Um, uh, the rise of the religious right. In India, you see that it's attack on women. In uh, Poland, look, they're coming for abortion rights. They're coming for sexual minorities, gay rights. They will come for everybody else eventually. They always do. Uh, But they go for the easy, softer targets first. And, And, you know, I think because still we live in a world where women are seen to be the extension of culture, of, of, of the national honor and pride and of the family, you know, they are seen to be an extension of that, that controlling them uh, is, is still, you know, is still acceptable. And you see that in the UK, you know, you've got Sharia courts here in the UK. The government is willing to use women's rights as a pawn in order to appease the Islam, Islamic Islamic groups, and which is why Sharia courts in this country are dealing only with women's issues, because it's all right. You know, you can do whatever the hell you want with women. Nobody cares. So It's frustrating, too, long, when you mention the culpability very, of the United States, uh, like mm-hmm. Saudi Arabia. I mean, we've, been, we've been in bed with Saudi Arabia forever. Mm-hmm. They're a human rights nightmare. Do you speak about mm-hmm. Saudi Arabia? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, I think... In a sense, it's it's really funny because I know a lot of us atheists and ex-Muslims, uh, there's a lot of criticism on the left that supports the Islamists. And they do it, you know, I'm someone on the left myself, but, you know, they do it because they think Islam is um, a, a minority religion and uh, n- minorities need to be protected. Therefore, they won't, they won't allow criticism of the hijab or Islam and they no platform you and try to silence you and so on and so forth. But the big part that that gets missed out from a focus on the left is that all governments, practically all governments, you know, uh, right wing governments, the the Republicans, uh, as well as the Democrats, the, the conservative Tory party, as well as the Labour Party, for example, in the UK, they all have relations with Islamic states and prop them up with military might, with economic might, uh, with, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of support, training and so on. I mean, if you look at research, how much money the UK government or the US government gives to training, um, you know, the uh, Saudi state and its military and its police and its forces of repression in the same way a lot of uh, relations between the EU and the Iranian regime. I know they have differences and there's various pushbacks here and there, but fundamentally, you know, they want to try to 
work together and make as much money as they can. And I think that's the bottom line um, in all instances, because we live in a, a society and a world that puts human pro- profit above human welfare. And, you know, so it, it it's a reality. Unfortunately, I think, though, that there are times in history when no matter how much support the powerful have, um, you know, this this human solidarity and empathy break through those walls and create change, you know. So we saw that uh, with the end of the apartheid regime in South Africa. I mean, it was glorious in a way when you think about how much Western governments had supported the apartheid regime and how just regular people just said that they, they wouldn't accept that anymore. They wouldn't accept their governments doing that anymore. And I think that is always the potential of being able to break through and change things. Unfortunately, with identity politics and the fact that you're not allowed to interfere and you're not allowed to talk about anybody else's problems and you have to just worry about your own little world and identity, it's very useful to governments as well because it stops us from working together to change things for the better. We've talked a lot on my broadcast about the power of stories. Mm -hmm. Like Miriam, you and I could sit down and we could throw data points at each other. Like these are the Mm. numbers of people that are repressed. And these are the numbers Mm. of women that had to endure FGM. It's hard to move people with data. But if you tell Mm. them a story, if you talk to them in a personal way about something that is an experience, and this is what the documentary Women Leaving Islam really does. Going through mental health myself, I I know what it's like when you're around people but still isolated. I know what it's like living a double life. Um, you know, I was like, I had to be a different person with my parents who wasn't like questioning religion versus another person who is questioning religion, scrutinizing it, being bold, but the attitude hurts my family. So I always had to be two different people. I have gotten so much love and kindness from strangers that was never afforded to me by my own family. And I don't know how to feel about that. I feel like I'm responsible to make this also reality for other women, not only in Arab country, in all this world. I believe in the women now, I believe in the feminist movement, I believe in all women have to be activists, helping each other to change this world. You know, the thing about stories, as you say, is that they they capture our hearts because they are universal. and. It, it, it must have captured you, even if you're not an ex-Muslim woman. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. we all see ourselves in that struggle for reaching a, a life that you feel you deserve and you're worthy of, you know. And I think that's what makes the documentary so powerful. And so it, it could have such a good impact if these stories reach people. And I guess that's what I'm hoping you, your viewers, can do as well is just get the word out. Just I just want people to be able to see these stories and really... And, you know, the other interesting thing is this film took three years to make because all the original women we interviewed um, uh, were, ended up not being in the film. And what I had wanted to do is to interview just regular people who are not activists, you know, because, gosh, the stories, I mean really mind-blowing stories, but all of them ended up being afraid, not wanting their faces shown, uh, pulling out. And so we had to redo it all with well-known activists um, because of that very reason. And we mentioned that at the beginning of the film. So it's, it's really, you know, these are activists who are willing to stick their neck out. They're, they represent, you know, an innumerable amount of people who can't do that yet. It's not 90 seconds. It is 90 minutes of your time, right? It doesn't fit on a Twitter post. It's not a fortune cookie, right? This Mm. is a longer view. It is so worth it. It is linked in the description box. Watch it, share it, link it. Help to get these stories out because stories like these will help to change perceptions, Mm. will help to liberate people who have been long oppressed. And, you know, our goal at the end of the day is to try to see people set free from these sort of totalitarian, Mm -hmm. high control cults 
that dehumanize our mm. fellow human beings. Any final thoughts on the documentary, Miriam Namazi? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, like you say, stories are really important. They are a way of resisting the status quo and changing things, you know, and really um, gaining the empathy and support and solidarity that's needed in order to make things better. And so I kind of feel like, uh, you know, when we're faced with a sort of religious right movement that's so brutal, uh, that decapitates people, that throws gay people off buildings, that hangs people in public from cranes because they are free thinkers, you know, when faced with that movement, uh, you know, and doing it nonviolently with creativity uh, and with humor and bringing stories to people, it's really the most fundamental way in which you can challenge such a dehumanizing movement is to humanize those who are, um, you know, being stepped on and, and, and crushed, really. And so I think it's just such a great way of resisting, such a positive, hopeful way of resisting. And it, I think it does give hope, which we really need a lot of. We need hope, we need courage in order to get to where we need to go. And I think these stories do do that, you know, and so hopefully people will enjoy it. I know it's really long. We wanted to cut it um, and make it into a normal documentary. And we thought, you know what? No, we're just going to leave it at an hour and a half. Just tolerate it. Manage. I'm sure you can manage to watch an hour and a half movie. <laughs> And it's it's beautiful. It's fantastic. I kept telling people, is it just me or is it is it inspiring and moving? Because I'm just so moved by it every time I watch it. But I just thought maybe I'm being too I'm too close to it or something. And I don't know how. No, no, no. You know, I'm just. It's I great. watched the documentary <laughs> and then I turned it on again and listened to it as I was in the kitchen. Mm. I was making dinner. You know, I'm I'm just doing my mm. thing because even listening to the stories again was that amazing thing. It's so personal, yeah. it's so rich, and I think it's so necessary. And yeah. just props to you for being a driving force behind that. And uh, to everybody involved, it is definitely worth your time. Miriam, after COVID is over, I look forward to seeing you in person on stage. I will be part of your standing ovation. I'm just saying, <laughs> I will be that guy, okay? Um, yeah. And uh, thank I, you for I, your wonderful yeah. work. Thank you for that. It's it's a real Thank honor. You. I will link to your website and everything. You can see it on the screen. And um, it's in the description box. All my best to you and yours, okay? You too. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone.